presidential election. We are very honored to have Professor Daniel Dawes with us today to present on racial inequities, fruit of America's poisonous tree, a look at the political determinants of health. Before I introduce our Dean, who will be introducing Professor Dawes and serving as today's moderator, I wanted to take care of a few housekeeping items. This presentation is being recorded. It will be available to watch at a later date, so please consider sharing the recording with family, friends, or colleagues that you think would enjoy it. We have nearly 320 registered for this event. In order to ensure that we give our full attention to Professor Dawes, please be sure to keep your microphone muted. If you have questions during the presentation, feel free to enter them the chat, into the chat box. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the event and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. With so many people joining us today and this timely topic, we do expect we may go slightly over the one hour mark. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Wayne Giles, who is the Dean of the UIC School of Public Health. Prior to joining UIC in 2017, Dean Giles spent 25 years at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where he led the Division for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention, the Division of Population Health, and the Division of Adult and Community Health. His portfolio at the CDC included running one of the organization's most diverse divisions with programmatic and research activities in community health promotion and addressing racial health disparities. Welcome, Dean Giles. Thank you so much, Kay. <clears throat> I want to welcome all of our alumni, students, faculty, staff, and friends of the UIC School of Public Health. As Kay mentioned, you are in for a treat this afternoon as we hear from Professor Daniel Dawes about the political determinants of health. But before I introduce Professor Dawes, I do want to recognize Dr. Ed Chen for his generous support for this lecture. Dr. Chen feels passionately, as many of you know, through your interactions with him about the School of Public Health and really wants to shine a light on the school, especially during the year 2020, which is the school's 50th anniversary. His donations to the school established a fund that allows us to invite speakers like the one that you'll hear from in just a few minutes that help to elevate the school's reputation. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen. Professor Daniel Dawes is an esteemed, as our esteemed speaker today. He is widely respected author, scholar, educator, and leader in health equity, health reform, and mental health movements. He currently serves as the executive director of the Thatcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia, and is a professor of health law, policy, and management. He is also the co-founder of the Health Equity Leadership um, and Exchange Network, a national network of over 2,000 governmental and non-governmental leaders and scholars focused on bolstering leadership and exchange of research, information, and solutions to advance evidence-based health equity-focused policies and programs. Dr. Dawes research focuses on the drivers of health and equity among under-resourced, vulnerable, and marginalized communities, and is the pioneer of the new approach of examining inequities, particularly the political determinants of health. He is also the author of two books. The first is entitled 150 Years of Obamacare and was published in March of 2016. Given what happened with the Supreme Court today, this book is extremely timely and uh, explores the backstory of the Affordable Care Act. His second book is entitled The Political Determinants of Health and was published in March of this year and argues that the political determinants of health create the social drivers, including poor environments, in, um, inadequate transportation, unsafe neighborhoods, and the lack of healthy food options, all of which impact the dynamics of health. By understanding these determinants, their origins, and their impact on the equitable distribution of opportunities and resources, we are better equipped to develop and implement actionable solutions to close the health gap. It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Dawes. Well, let me thank you so much, Dean Giles, for that 
very warm introduction. And um, good evening, everyone. I am so honored to join you today and talk about racial inequities, these fruit of America's poisonous tree, right? What is that about? We're going to look specifically at the political determinants of health, as Dean Giles mentioned. Uh, but before that, really want to thank the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Public Health for the invitation to be with you tonight, to have this uh, discourse. Uh, we are going to move further upstream, as you heard Dean Giles mention. Uh, we are going to look at how health inequities are concretized in our structures and systems, in our communities, and how they've been, how they've been concretized over time, how they've been entrenched in these structures and systems. So um, as Dean Giles also mentioned, today is quite a special uh, day for me, having worked on the Affordable Care Act uh, with a group of 300 national organizations to advance a health equity agenda within that law. So I'm happy to take any questions uh, that you may have uh, when we reach the question and answer period. So without further ado, country of ours, the United States of America. You know, for too long, many racial and ethnic minorities and other vulnerable populations and marginalized groups have found themselves in a precarious situation. Their health, their lives literally hanging in the balance, many of them falling through the cracks of our health system, our educational system, human services system, public health, housing, behavioral health, and the list goes on. They struggle to live in a society that has intentionally erected barrier after barrier to weaken their bodies and hasten their deaths. For over 400 years, these groups have experienced inequities throughout the life course, from womb to tomb. These are inequities in health status and healthcare. We know they're widely documented. In fact, we have over 7,000 peer reviewed journal articles in public health and beyond documenting these disparities, right? From the fact that you have higher rates of asthma, learning disabilities, dental, speech, vision, behavior, and emotional problems among Native American, African American, and Latino groups, or Latinx groups. We know that if you have a mental illness, uh, over 350,000 people die prematurely from this uh, illness each year. And if you have a serious mental illness, your life expectancy declines significantly to about 56 years on average. If you're an LGBTQ youth, higher risk for substance use, cancers, injuries, cardiovascular diseases. How about children born to an African-American mother, right? They're twice as likely to die before reaching their first birthday as a baby born to a white mother. And then, of course, there are rural disparities. There are disparities relevant to us today with COVID and this triple pandemic that we've been going through. So I want to start with a story tonight that highlights what I think is a, an incredible case, a compelling case for why we must continue to push for health equity in America and why with the privilege and the power that each of you have, that you must use it to advance the cause. In this case, it started with a headache in late March. Then came the body aches. At first, Shalandra Rollins' doctor thought that it was the flu. By April 7, three days after she was finally diagnosed with COVID-19, the 38-year-old teaching assistant, who had two years earlier managed to beat the odds, having lacked health insurance at times during her life, working in low-paying jobs, experiencing limited access to care, working hard to get her associate's degree, told her mom that she was feeling winded. Within an hour, she was pushed into an ambulance, conscious but struggling to breathe, bound for a hospital. An hour later, she would be pronounced dead. You see, it's Shalandra Rollins, a mother of two, had a number of factors that put her at higher risk of dying from COVID-19. Like her mother, she had diabetes. She was black with a low salary job and very few resources. You see, today we've, of course, lost nearly a quarter of a million people to COVID-19, and the majority of these individuals had an underlying health condition. We know that the underlying factors such as cancer, asthma, heart disease, and other chronic diseases strike disproportionately within communities of color and lower socioeconomic status communities. And as a result, these communities experience a greater risk or are at greater risk 
of complications from COVID-19. You see, the inequities that predate COVID-19 did not suddenly appear, right, to the amazement of many people. No, they were always there, nor are they inapplicable as we think about how they came to be. Minorities, people with disabilities, and other vulnerable communities still contend with neighborhoods that are largely devoid of necessary health protective and health sustaining resources. And they still contend with the political drivers, right, or determinants that created, perpetuated, and exacerbated these inequities. We know that racial and ethnic minorities, people with disabilities, lower SES individuals, LGBTQ plus individuals, individuals living in rural communities, they die disproportionately each year. And the toll it takes in this country is unconscionable. But the one thing that we must always remember is that here in the United States, the nation's health is not an organic outcome. It is not a coincidence that certain groups of Americans experience higher premature death rates or poor health outcomes than others. It is not a coincidence. Why? Why is this happening? Why has it been happening? Well, of course, as public health leaders, we recognize that a variety of forces collectively impact our health and determine the quality and the extent of our lives on this earth. These, of course, include the social determinants of health, environmental, economic, behavioral health, healthcare, and genetic factors. It is true, as we all know, that air pollution, climate change, toxic waste sites, unclean water, lack of fresh fruits and vegetables, unsafe, unsecure, and unstable housing, poor quality education, inaccessible transportation, lack of parks and other recreational areas, and a host of other factors play an outsized role on our overall health and well-being. They increase our stress, they expose us to harmful elements, and they limit our opportunities to thrive. You see, these social determinants of health primarily, right, play an outsized role in these human-made pre-existing inequities. But underlying each one is a political determinant that we can no longer ignore. Too often, we've been stopping at the social drivers of inequities, failing to dig even deeper to see the depths of the problem and understand its root causes and distribution. And as a result, we've been missing the link between the social determinants of health and their political roots. This pandemic demonstrates the inconvenient and harsh truth about the impact of social determinants of health and how collectively these factors significantly contribute to our society's health inequities. It shows the compounding effect of political determinants over personal responsibility. Let me repeat that one more time. It shows the compounding effect a political determinants over personal responsibilities. How? Because no matter how much African Americans, Native Americans, Native Hawaiians, Latinx Americans, Pacific Islander Americans, and lower socioeconomic status individuals and others try to act responsibly, there are always structural, institutional, interpersonal, and yes, even intrapersonal obstacles hindering them, right? Beneath these communities notice have been political determinants that have pulled and continue to pull strings that prevent them from achieving their optimal health and full potential. And so it is no wonder then why COVID-19 is not striking all communities equally. Why? Well, because our economic and social policies have not been benefiting all population groups equally. Think about who gets tested who gets access to health care and the quality of care that they get. Um, how about education, access to the Internet, even access to water and access to food are politically determined. So Shalandra's story, in effect, highlights how one political determinant after another resulted in a continual tightening of a chokehold on her community and the eventual disaster that brought to light the inequities plaguing it. 
high obesity rates, diabetes, maternal mortality, depression, and many other health issues can be firmly linked back to political determinants of health, right? By understanding these political determinants, their origins, their impact, and their interconnection with the social and the environmental determinants of health, we will be better equipped to develop and implement actionable solutions to close the health gap. You see, what Shalandra's story shows us is that behind virtually every health disparity and subsequent death, especially during this time of COVID-19, there were specific and insidious political determinants of health that led to the person's premature death. So for a moment, I want to paint a picture of the tree of health for you. Initially, you may notice on your screen a tree, the fruit, the individuals, or even the tombstone surrounding this tree. But actually, this picture is far more representative of what our society currently has to offer some of its most vulnerable people. You see, the tree represents society. There have always been co-laborers in this fight for health equity. And I know many of you um, watching this, listening today, participating, are in fact co-laborers who have tended to this tree. We have worked tirelessly to feed this tree evidence-based policies, programs, and practices with the hope that the tree would provide fruit that would benefit all of society. However, the reality is that there's also been others who've been working overtime to supply the tree with that which would do it harm. These are the roots that are undergirded by racism, classism, homophobia, and many other deleterious motives. From the bottom of the tree's base, all the way up and through to the ends of its branches, what is supplied to the tree is eventually multiplied by the tree. So now due to the root causes of inequities, the fruit represents higher rates of diabetes, inaccessible, safe, and secure housing, a lack of nutritious food, and any other number of those outcomes that we now know as the social determinants of health. And as that poisonous and sometimes rotted fruit falls to the ground, the tree that had the potential to provide life-giving nourishment to all who encountered it now only leaves death and destruction in its shadow from one generation to the next. But here's the good news. I want you to imagine with me what could and should have been. The roots of the tree, which anchors the tree and is supposed to absorb nutrients from the soil, represents the political determinants of health and the detrimental factors that the tree's roots were absorbing include racism, sexism, classism, and many other evils. Every political and policy decision that is made feeds into this tree, yielding fruit which permeates throughout our society. But if the tree of health is rooted in health equity, the end result is a society that is nourished, cared for, and capable of achieving its full potential. Chalandra's story is not just a truly tragic story. It is a reminder that her death was not only preventable, but downright avoidable if only she had been fed by a tree of health that bore life-sustaining fruit. So this begs the question, how did we get here? Why did this happen to Chalandra in the first place? Right now, I want to talk about big P policy and little p policy, governmental policy with big P policy and non-governmental policy, lowercase p. How did we get here? Well, we know that inequality gets under our skin, and it leads to accelerated aging in our bodies or biological weathering, as Dr. Arlene Geronimus of the University of Michigan has coined. And it increases our rates of chronic diseases as other researchers, like David Williams at Harvard, has identified. It destroys the social and the economic fabric of our neighborhoods. So I want you to think about it this way. Think about a block of concrete and a constant drip of water hitting that concrete. At first, you don't notice the impact 
that that stream of water is having on the concrete block, right? But over time, what does that drip of water do? It starts to wear away at the concrete. This is essentially what racism does to our bodies, what all of these isms do to us over time. If you were to think about it, as epigeneticists have um, documented, if you look at the telomeres at the end of our DNAs, right, and you had a 40-year-old black man and a 40-year-old white man, what they would probably see in that 40-year-old black man was that he had advanced aging. Perhaps his telomeres looked to be that of a 60-year-old man. So it does take a toll. There is intergenerational trauma. And this then begs the question, how did they come to be in the first place? We've talked about the social determinants of health, the structural conditions in which we are born, which we live in, in which we work in, worship in, et cetera, right? But we must ask ourselves, how did those structural conditions come to be in the first place? How did they originate? So tonight I want to take us back 400 years. Let's talk about how this happened. So Massachusetts, right, was the first colony, as many of us know, to legalize slavery. And other colonies followed suit very quickly. But as if that weren't enough to hold down a group of black folks, these policymakers decided that they were going to also enact additional laws that would prevent black and indigenous populations from being able to realize health equity, from addressing uh, the social determinants of health. How, you ask? Well, they created and passed and implemented and then even enforced policies that prohibited these individuals, black and indigenous populations, from raising their own food, from earning their own money, from learning to read and write, especially English, from being educated, from being unable to socialize, right, in many respects. In fact, there were laws that prohibited enslaved individuals from going beyond a one-mile radius. In order to do so, they had to have a pass from their masters. And if they were traveling at night, had to actually have a lantern. There are a host of other policies that were created during that time. But essentially what happened was a recycling of these policies from one generation to the next, from one century into the next. We know then that there was an attempt by abolitionists once the country was formed as a constitutional form of government in 1789, not only to abolish slavery, but to elevate health equity. We'll talk about that momentarily. That was a short-lived advocacy attempt. It would take them 75 years before they would be able to realize that dream. But again, that too was cut short. We'll talk about how that happened. But I want to bring us into the period in which Jim Crow reared its ugly head with a vengeance. And we saw again the proliferation of policies intended to prohibit enslaved people, or actually now formerly enslaved people, but uh, undervalued people, black people, brown people in this country, uh, from being able to address their social needs, right, their social determinants, the social factors that keep us alive. And after that, we now go into the early 1900s. And many of you may be familiar with the issue of redlining, but I want to I actually spend a few uh, seconds talking about this because we know that the country was segregated to a degree, but then the federal government, a lot of folks believe that it was the commercial banks that redlined first, and that's not true. It was the federal government through the Homeowners Loan Corporation Act under the Franklin D. Roosevelt administration that came in and actually signed into law the Homeowners Loan Corporation Act. This law essentially uh, set forth uh, property appraisers working in concert with state and local policymakers sent them across the United States into the into over 200 cities, um, and and they went into the neighborhoods in these cities, grading them from either an A, B, C, or D. An A being desirable, excellent, um, B meaning you know less desirable but still desirable, C being declining, and then red was deemed hazardous. And if you all had to venture a guess as to which communities, which neighborhoods do you think they scored a D and gave a red, color-coded red to? 
And if you guess the black community, you are absolutely right. There were, of course, a few poor white communities, but the effect was overwhelmingly, disproportionately, black communities were redlined. And then the yellow communities were what they termed undesirable immigrant communities. So these were your Mexican communities, your Cuban, your German, Jewish, Irish, Italian communities, right, um, that were seen as more risky investments. Well, at that point, uh, you know, the federal government sends these reports back after they uh, compile them, send them back to D.C., and the federal government used the, that report to determine whether to give certain neighborhoods access to VA and FHA loans, mortgage loans. And, um, and essentially what that did was to starve these communities of the resources, further starving them of the resources that they needed in order to thrive, right? So let's bring it back home. After this uh, episode, we've then moved away from what we call, or what we call facially discriminatory policies where they're explicitly racist and intentionally discriminatory in trying to keep out certain population groups from, raising, from realizing the benefits of that policy or law to then facially neutral policies, right? So this was now after World War II and there was an attempt to pass, um, pass bills such as the Highway Act, the Housing Act, and a host of other laws um, that created the Urban Renewal Program in cities across the country, right? And um, these laws didn't explicitly discriminate against black and brown communities, but they had a disparate impact. And so I want to pull it back now into public health. How does this work? Well, we all have been, I hope, we've traveled, whether you're in Chicago, you've traveled in Chicago, or across the United States. If you've been to Miami or to Atlanta, to even St. Petersburg, Florida, Baltimore, New York, Chicago, L.A., you name it. If you go into these cities, and you go into the black communities, you'll oftentimes see running right through the middle of these neighborhoods a major highway, right? And a lot of times people will say to themselves, well, how did that highway come to be in the first place? I mean, why would they build a community around a highway? Didn't they know better? Well, yeah, they did know better, and they didn't build it around those communities that were there first. But again, because they were valued less in the eyes of these policymakers, they were seen as being the less disruptive uh, to the government's plans. And so uh, with the proliferation of these policies working in concert with state and local policymakers, they created these highways, they bulldo bulldozed um, homes, apartments, and houses where African Americans and Latinos and others uh, have resided, uh, placing these um, highways. We know that in many communities, they also raised housing to place parking lots. We know as well that uh, if you go to many communities, they raised housing to place bus depots. And uh, in fact, for many of you who've ever been to New York, uh, in Manhattan, six of the seven bus depots were placed in Harlem, New York. And today, is it any wonder that they have the highest, these black and brown children especially, have the highest rates of asthma in the country? And all throughout the country, we know that many black and brown folks have the highest rates of asthma. Why? Well, we know through public health, it's because they're breathing in the most polluted air, right? But again, we must connect that, right? We know that it's connected to the increased smog from the highway, from these parking lots, from these bus depots, and the list goes on. But again, we must connect those social determinants, those structural conditions to, to their political roots. What was the instigator that drove that result? Today, we know from that period that many of these policies have been linked, um, directly linked to aggressive breast cancer prevalence among African-American women. They have the deadliest form of breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer. And again, it shows the compounding effect of the political determinants undergirded by racism. What has this resulted today? It's resulted in a poverty tax on many of these communities in the form of higher payments for auto insurance, for mortgage loans, and lower property appraisals, from pro pro poverty taxes to now food deserts, food swamps, right? Food, pharmacy, hospital deserts, making it more difficult to access resources to improve health and maintain health. And we've now moved away from, we're going from redlining to what they call blue lining in the form of climate gentrification as a result of climate change. 
again displacing minorities across the United States. So from a life expectancy um, argument, why does this matter? It's, it's very serious because we know that as Michael Marmot out of UCL in London, uh, one of the trailblazers of the social determinants of health movement has um, stated, you know, life expectancy as a measure of health tells us a great deal about how a society is doing. But the inequalities in health in that society tell us even more, right? Today, we rank 43rd in the world in terms of life expectancy. And if you disaggregated the um, population groups by race and ethnicity, white Americans, if we took all white people in this country and they formed their own country, they would rank 50th in the world. Again, lower than 43rd. If we took all black people in this country and they created their own country, they would rank 103rd in the world in terms of life expectancy. And if we were to take all indigenous populations and they were their own country, they would rank even lower, 143rd in the world. Interestingly enough, right before COVID slammed us, the Lancet had actually published a study showing that life expectancy was expected to decline significantly in the United States from 43rd to 64th in the world. All the while, we are becoming a more pluralistic, racially pluralistic society, right? And if many of these racial and ethnic minorities are coming from communities, right, in which it is hard to thrive, in which it is hard for them to have better health outcomes, then this creates economic and national security crises in this country, an issue that I am very happy to talk about. But going back to the map, just uh, to wrap things up on this, if you notice, it shouldn't be, again, a surprise that these communities that have the lowest life expectancy, whether you're in Chicago, Rockford, or Illinois, these are your racial and ethnic minority communities. If you overlay the redlined maps and all of these other maps that we have, again, showing the political determinants of health, right, on these population groups, it's no surprise that they die much younger and have poor health outcomes. So let me switch gears a minute now. So we've learned about how policy has been a driving force for many of the health inequities we have observed or experienced in our country, right? These are the political determinants of health inequities. But now I want to go a, a different route. I want to actually talk about more positive uh, things and the, the advocacy campaign throughout our country by a limited group of folks, health equity champions throughout the ages who continue to hold that light of health equity as brightly as they possibly could, right? And used the political levers to advance a health equity agenda. Let's quickly talk about that. So one of my favorite quotes uh, by William Faulkner says, the past is never dead. It's not even past. And I hope that many of our eyes have been opened as a result of this triple pandemic that we are going through, right? Beyond the COVID-19 pandemic to this racial and social reckoning to the looming behavioral health crisis, right? And beyond. So let me go back now. You heard me mention that in 1789, in 1789, a group of abolitionists, mental health reformers, advocates on behalf of the, the homeless, and others came together once the newly formed government um, was open for business. And they determined in their hearts to push this health equity agenda and to actually recruit one of our nation's greatest political influencers, Benjamin Franklin. They got Benjamin Franklin to come on board and uh, they said, Benjamin, would you please allow yourself to join this cause? Would you add your name to this petition that we want to send to the House and the Senate? We want to send to Congress imploring them not only to abolish slavery in America, but to also stop the separation of children from their mothers, the breakup of enslaved families, right? To provide access to health care, to actually provide adequate clothing and food and education and employment opportunities to these vulnerable populations. Well, Abraham Lincoln, although he had been a slave owner for most of his life, once he got older, he also matured in his thinking and realized 
what an evil institution slavery was. And so he said, sure. They gave him the petition. He signed his name. It got to Congress. And if you think that we are having a contentious debate over health care law and policy in this country, oh, my goodness, it was extremely contentious. They were so upset that Benjamin Franklin would dare to send such a petition. The Senate decided we're not going to even give him any thought. We're not going to give this any thought, uh, pay this any attention. But the House said they couldn't let it go. We have to let Benjamin Franklin know that he had no right to bring up this issue. So Benjamin Franklin, um, you know, still pushed the agenda, but the House, after a few weeks of debating his petition, actually created a letter and bullet by bullet made an argument for why they could not stop the separation of children from their mothers, why they couldn't stop the breakup of these enslaved families, why they could not provide medical care to these vulnerable populations, not just black, but older adults, children and others, women, why they couldn't provide educational opportunities, essentially arguing that that was best left to the states. It was a confederalism argument, essentially, right? That they were, the states are closest to the people, therefore they know what's best for the people within their boundaries. Sad, sad moment indeed, three weeks after that letter was received by Benjamin Franklin and before he could actually respond, um, he died. And that was the first time in US history that the light of health equity had dimmed in public policy. We know then that it would take decades later, 75 years in fact, before we would be able to regroup and a host of abolitionists and others got together in 1863, working with President Abraham Lincoln on a bill called the Freedmen's Bureau Act. Well, if you thought that 1789's debate was pretty contentious, oh my gosh, it was even more contentious. Why? We were in the middle of a major civil war. Well, President Lincoln and his supporters believed that it was the right thing to do, that they needed to create a comprehensive health policy that would provide health care services to these uh, uh, people who would be freed. Uh, he wanted to provide clothing and food as well as security because he knew the slave masters would not protect these uh, individuals. He wanted to provide education and real employment opportunities, right? And so they crafted this bill. They negotiated for two years, but unfortunately, there was one provision that just couldn't get any support. It was the most contentious of all the provisions. And if you guessed access to health care, medical care, you are absolutely correct. At that point, the Congress decided to compromise and they struck that provision. It got to President Lincoln's desk, he signed it into law, but four weeks later, as we all know, he was assassinated. And not to squander that crisis, his supporters said, you know what, we believe the law is written in such a way that it has given us the authority to provide health services. So for many of you who are scholars of history, and you know that there were these Freedmen's Hospitals that were created, in fact, Howard University's hospital was a Freedmen's Hospital. They were created throughout the country. It wasn't because the law had explicitly allowed it, but because after Lincoln died, his supporters really pushed the agenda. Well, as you probably have seen or you know, the Freedmen's Bureau Act underwent tremendous threats from opponents of health equity from the time that it was signed into law up to the seventh anniversary, every single year, these opponents of health equity tried every trick in the book to repeal the law. And on the seventh anniversary of the law, they succeeded. They finally succeeded in dismantling America's first comprehensive health equity focused policy, right? The first major bill or law to tackle the social determinants of health. It would then take us 150 years later to realize a very comprehensive, inclusive, and equitable health law called the Affordable Care Act, which I got to work on, and I'm happy to talk about how we actually made that happen. But in many respects, we took lessons 
from those attempts at advancing those health laws, um, we took those strategies into our deliberations. We actually modeled, in many respects, the prin principles uh, from that Freedmen's Bureau Act, along with a host of other health policies, to push the agenda. For the sake of time, I, I, I'll just quickly go through mental health and universal health by saying that, you know, there was also an attempt in this country to push for mental health reform in America. Dorothea Dix, a very popular school teacher, a huge mental health reformer during her time, uh, spent four decades of her life going around the country pleading with lawmakers to do right by people with mental illnesses and substance use disorders. She finally got the U.S. Congress to pass the bill for the benefit of the indigent insane, only to then get it to a president who she thought, along with other mental health reformers, um, that he would actually sign it into law, Franklin Pierce, because three months before he became president, he had witnessed a terrible tragedy. He had just left a funeral with his wife and their only child at the time, a son. They were traveling by train, which is a relatively new invention at the time, and the train crashed in a ditch. The only person to have lost his life that day was their son. His skull had split open. There was fragments everywhere, blood everywhere. Poor Mrs. Pierce was never the same again. She actually had succumbed to clinical depression and anxiety for the rest of her life. And the president became a substance misuser, an alcoholic, and is now deemed one of the least effective presidents in our time. Having witnessed the deterioration of, in his wife's health, right, from depression and anxiety, People thought surely he would be the first president in U.S. history that would usher in comprehensive mental health reform, but he didn't. In fact, he vetoed it, and in one of the longest veto messages I've ever read, um, he set the federal policy of inaction in mental health policies for almost 100 years in this country, again, borrowing the same arguments that had been used by the 1789 Congress, saying it's not the federal government's role to take care of people with mental illnesses. That's the state's role, right? Well, after that opportunity, it would take 125 years before we got President uh, Abraham Lincoln to introduce the specs of a comprehensive mental health reform bill. He would become the first president to sign mental health reform into law. But for those of you who were around in the 1980, what happened? He got it signed a month before the 1980 election. President Reagan wins the election, and his administration went about immediately preventing further implementation of the Mental Health Systems Act and then dismantling um, very quickly what had already been implemented. It was a terrible tragedy for mental health champions. In fact, Mrs. Carter, former First Lady Mrs. Carter, Rosalind Carter, when we were um, actually getting together uh, to decide how we were going to leverage the Obama presidency to push for comprehensive health reform, had this sense of urgency. She remembered that that window of opportunity only lasts but so long, and she pushed us to ensure that children's mental health at least would be included in President Obama's health reform uh, negotiations. Well, as, as you all probably can tell, we did uh, create this national working group we brought together this, these disparate campaigns around universal health, minority health, mental health, and, and, and more, right? Together, they had never before gotten to get to work in this fashion, right, at least in recent years. So we brought these disparate campaigns, and we said we've got to leverage, we've got to harness that power of collaboration to get this comprehensive health reform law passed, right, once and for all. And so if you don't remember anything else about the ACA, the ACA alone is a big deal because it is the most comprehensive mental health reform law that we have ever realized in the United States, right? Something that I always find very interesting, uh, along with the host of 62 health equity provisions that are in this law. So when we talk about what's at stake with the Affordable Care Act and the Supreme Court case, uh, there is a lot at stake. So let me go to the court now and to talk quickly about you know, where the court stands on inequities. It's a, uh, you know, when you look at the Voting Rights Act, you, uh, the Voting Rights uh, cases, you look at um, affirmative action cases and the like, you know, there is this recycling of an argument essentially from the court. So you remember me talking about how, uh, you know, during 
President Abraham Lincoln's time during uh, Reconstruction, during that period, there were several civil rights laws that were created uh, by the federal government, by Congress, right, that were signed into law. But there was a court, the Supreme Court at the time, um, actually had uh, a majority um, who were southern state sympathizers, right? Um, some of them even slave owners themselves, who ignored and, and um, tried to push this argument that uh, there were no vestiges of um, segregation, segregation by past decree. These inequities were not created by a political act. That's simply not true. It is a socially derived um, uh, result. Well, the court today now seems to have acknowledged, well, okay, fine. You know what? The evidence is, uh, you know, too much for us to deny that there are vestiges. And so they've stated vestiges of past segregation by state decree do remain in our society. Past wrongs committed by the state and in its name are a stubborn fact of history. And stubborn facts of history linger and persist. But though we cannot escape our history, neither must we overstate its consequences in fixing legal responsibilities. Think about that for a moment. Why is this alarming? It's alarming for at least three reasons. First, the court fails to take into account the evidence from a broad spectrum of research in public health, medicine, science, nursing, etc., demonstrating the lasting impact that these vestiges of slavery segregation and subsequent unjustified discrimination have on population groups. Second, it has a rippling effect into other case law, setting precedent for other policies commissioned by other governmental bodies, right? And third, the court has been arbitrarily determining the point, just like the court in the 1860s, right, 1870s, just like that court, arbitrarily determining the point at which these vestiges of legally sanctioned discrimination cease to significantly impact certain communities, especially arguing that after a certain time, it doesn't matter anymore. So let's connect the dots to the social determinants of health. Why does this matter? Why am I pushing this argument? You see, the court would rather argue, right, or view inequities as products of private choices or products of the social determinants so they do not have constitutional implications or legally enforceable remedies, right? What they are essentially arguing is black and, black and white people just don't like each other naturally, right? Although we know that's not true. And, and so it's a socially derived inequity. Health equity advocates now who continue to make the case that inequities are solely socially derived and fail to show the political connection will only bolster the Supreme Court's viewpoint, thus weakening legal protections to check these structural and these institutional forms of discrimination, as well as denying legal remedies to those impacted by health inequities. So in the few minutes that I have left, let's talk about how we can leverage the political determinants of health, right? Uh, we are living in a very serious time, an unprecedented uh, pandemic, we know that coronavirus, much like many past pandemics, negatively impacts and further disadvantages lower socioeconomic status communities, racial and ethnic minority communities, people with disabilities, and immigrant communities the worst. Review of studies after studies, right, have shown that in this country that when it comes to pandemics, natural disasters, wars, and other crises, and once they're reviewed post-event, these disparate groups are impacted more than any other population groups. But interestingly, when it comes to pandemics, we have never been successful in advancing an equitable policy response during those times. We have been able, as you've heard, during times of wars, natural disasters, recessions and depressions, but never during a pandemic. And I'm hoping that during COVID-19, during this pandemic, we may actually be able to stem the tide and do something about it so that every single population group in the United States stands a fair chance of surviving and, of course, thriving moving forward. So this is a very wonky model that I created, right, on the political determinants of health. And um, I don't have time to get into this, but 
you know, essentially what I want to bring to your attention is the fact that to advance health equity, you must demonstrate the value of investing in change. In the United States, advocates must understand the disquieting and harsh truth that the political determinants of health inequities have rarely been addressed unless their reduction or elimination served other purposes. The success, you see, of any health equity advocacy, it depends on how palatable they are to a commercial interest and whether there is a government investment value, right? So rarely does an advocacy effort succeed if it significantly interferes or undermines commercial activities or national security. Happy to talk about how that works, uh, but you can talk about the moral determinants of health. You can make the moral case, right? People are sick and dying uh, disproportionately. And you can talk about this till your, till your tongue is bleeding, and it still won't catch the ear of these policymakers at the federal level at least. Never has, and I don't anticipate it happening right now. So let me close by talking about the five things that we can do to elevate health equity in America. I think the good news is that structural barriers and the resulting inequities are not permanent, but it's going to take greater action and collective agreement from all of us, right? Um, all of us as individuals committed to stomping out inequities uh, to formulate and execute the strategies and the policies to overcome them. How do we do this? Well, here are five things. First, we've got to engage in tough conversations around race, place, and class, and advocate for a full commitment to tackling health inequities upstream in all areas, going further upstream than we've ever been before. We've got to work upstream to address the social and the political determinants of health inequities, understanding when they are at play. Then we have to research the history of our community. You know, we're such a transient community. We move from community to community, and it is so easy to make judgments about the people living in that community. Why aren't they pulling themselves up by their bootstraps? Why can't they do better, right? Well, without understanding the historical context in which these political determinants have been created one after the other, providing and creating this continuing uh, tightening of the chokehold on them, it, 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 it's easy to make those judgments, right? So we've got to address the past policies and programs at all levels that created and perpetuated and even exacerbated uh, these inequities, remembering that in law and policy, exclusion has always been easier to realize in policy than inclusion. Fourth, we've got to strengthen our networks and engagement. We've become so complacent, complacent over time. And we've weakened our networks and engagement. We have got to continuously engage, not just by voting, but throughout the entire process, not just by creating this policy, right, but even through uh, the regulatory uh, aspects to ensure that it's enforced and enforced according uh, to the will of the people. And then lastly, we have to understand that health equity begins and it ends with the political determinants of health. Let me close by actually um, – uh, highlighting this uh, great mentor and friend of mine, Dr. David Thatcher, uh, an incredible Surgeon General uh, here in the United States who wasn't afraid to tackle the most contentious issues impacting communities of color. You know, I think that health inequities and health injustices will continue to persist like they have for generations in America unless we seriously tackle the root causes. And so I want to urge you all, that we need leaders who care enough, know enough. You have studied these inequities, right? Looking at it through multiple lenses, harnessing the collaboration through multidisciplinary collaboration, that you have the courage to do enough and persevere until the job is done. This is a movement that is not for the faint of heart, not for the weak. It is going to take a huge effort on our part to continue to push for health equity in America. I want to thank you all again for the privilege of your time and thank the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Public Health for this opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you, Dean Giles. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.